Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about three very important concepts in stoichiometry, and those are limiting reagent, theoretical yield, and percent yield. So suppose I was walking around my kitchen and I had a sudden craving for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And suppose I was so hungry that I wanted to make as many peanut butter and jelly sandwiches as I could. So the next step then would be to look around the kitchen and find out how much peanut butter and jelly and bread that I have. So I'm looking around my kitchen and I find that I have four jars of peanut butter and I have five jars of jelly. So at this point it's looking like I can make a whole lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But then I look and see how much bread that I have and I find that I only have two slices of bread. So the question then would be how much, how many peanut butter and jelly sandwiches could I make? And the obvious answer to this question is I can only make one peanut butter and jelly sandwich because I only have two slices of bread. Even though I have more than enough peanut butter, more than enough jelly to make numerous peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, because I have such a small amount of bread, I can only make a small amount of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So the bread is basically limiting how many peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that I can make. So the bread in this case is analogous to what chemists refer to as the limiting reagent. And the limiting reagent is defined as the reactant that runs out first in a chemical reaction. So all of the other reactants, these are called excess reagent, and there's usually only one limiting reagent. And the limiting reagent is what determines a quantity that we call the theoretical yield. And the theoretical yield is the amount, or more commonly the mass, of a product that can be formed in a chemical reaction. So again, the theoretical yield, that's always based upon the limiting reagent. So in the peanut butter and jelly example, our limiting reagent was the bread, and our theoretical yield that was determined by our limiting reagent was one peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Now, doing these problems with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches is all fine and good, but let's see if we can't transfer this knowledge uh, to a chemical problem. So this problem says, uh, first of all, this problem is based on this chemical equation here. This chemical equation describes the reaction between calcium and oxygen to form calcium oxide. And it says that if 9.0 grams of calcium is allowed to react with 4.1 grams of oxygen, then what is the limiting reagent? And it also says to calculate the theoretical yield of calcium oxide in grams. So uh, we can see here that we have more calcium than we do oxygen by mass. So we might be tempted to say, okay, well, oxygen must be our limiting reagent since we have less of it. But this is not necessarily true because uh, our balanced chemical equation doesn't necessarily say anything about mass. It's talking about moles. The chemical equation tells us that two moles of calcium reacts with one mole of oxygen to form two moles of calcium oxide. It doesn't say anything about mass. So what we, need to, what we need to do is we need to convert the masses that we have of calcium and of oxygen and we need to convert those into moles. And of course we do that using the molar masses which are given on the periodic table. And in so doing, we get 0.22 moles of calcium and 0.13 moles of oxygen. Now, looking at these two amounts, you might be tempted to say, okay, well we have a smaller amount of oxygen by moles than we do calcium, so that must mean that oxygen must be our limiting reagent. Well, this isn't necessarily true because if you look at our, our, our uh, balanced chemical equation, it says that we need two moles of calcium for every one mole of oxygen. So even though we have less oxygen than we do calcium, we need twice as much calcium for a given amount of oxygen to make this reaction go. So what I'm gonna to do to determine my limiting reagent is I'm going to start with one of the molar amounts of the reactants and I'm gonna use that molar ratio given from the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation to convert from one reactant to another and then I'm gonna compare and see how much of that reactant that I have versus how much of that reactant that I need. So that, might, that may have sounded confusing uh, just then but let me go ahead and show you what I mean. So starting with our 0.22 moles of calcium, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out how much oxygen is needed to react completely with this 0.22 moles of calcium. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my coefficient in front of the calcium on the bottom, and I'm gonna put my coefficient in front of the oxygen on top. So this is just a simple 
stoichiometric mole to mole conversion, trying to find out how much oxygen is required to react completely with my calcium here. And I find that this value turns out to be 0 0.11 moles of oxygen. So that means that this much oxygen, 0 0.11 moles, is required to react with 0 0.22 moles of calcium. So notice that we have more than enough oxygen. We have 0 0.13 moles of oxygen. So we have more than enough oxygen that is required to react with 0 0.22 moles of calcium. So this must mean that calcium actually is our limiting reagent. So even though we have less oxygen than we do calcium, because we need twice as much calcium as we do oxygen and we don't have that much, that means that calcium is actually our limiting reagent. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use calcium to determine our theoretical yield, not oxygen. So we've just determined that calcium is our limiting reagent. So we're going to use that 0.22 moles of calcium to determine our theoretical yield. I'm going to do a mole to mole conversion where I'm going to convert from calcium to calcium oxide, moles of calcium to moles of calcium oxide. I'm going to put my two moles of calcium on the bottom. I'm going to put my two moles of calcium oxide on top. And this, con this conversion may seem uh, insignificant because two divided by two is one. So you might feel like you can skip this step, but this isn't always going to be the case. This, the, uh, the coefficients in front of these two things only aren't always going to be similar. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of, of doing this step, even though it may appear unnecessary. And then all I have to do is I have to uh, just convert from moles of calcium oxide to grams of calcium oxide. And of course, we're going to do this using the molar mass of calcium oxide, which again can easily be figured out just by looking at the molar masses of calcium and oxygen on the periodic table and then, uh, and then adding them together. So at this point, all we have to do is cancel out our units. So we have moles of calcium canceling with moles of calcium, moles of calcium oxide canceling out with moles of calcium oxide, and our theoretical yield in grams of calcium oxide is 12 grams of calcium oxide. So that is how we determine the theoretical yield. You gotta figure out your limiting reagent first. So, so just to recap our steps here, we converted the masses into moles and then we figured out how much of one reactant is required to react completely with another reactant. And then we compared to see, do we have more than enough or do we not have enough? And that is what helps us determine our limiting reagent. Once we determine our limiting reagent, we use that to convert from moles of a reactant to moles of the product. And then it's just a matter of using molar mass to convert from moles of the product to grams of the product. So it's a pretty involved uh, process, but if you do it enough times, uh, you'll get used to it and you'll be able to do it quickly uh, in the event of a test or something like that. All right, so with that, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about percent yield. Now, percent yield is a quantity that expresses the effectiveness of a synthetic procedure. So we know that chemistry is not just something that we do on paper. Uh, chemistry is actually carried out in labs and labs have plenty of errors. In fact, when you run a chemical reaction, it's usually not the chemical reaction that is the hard part. It's the purification and identification of the product that's usually the tricky part that is composed of many, many steps. And all of these steps may have a certain amount of error associated with them. Uh, you could uh, Also, you could have side reactions. Any product that you get can react with something else to form an entirely new product. So this is why the, uh, act, the yield that you get in a laboratory of a product is usually going to be less than your theoretical yield. So again, percent yield expresses how effective your procedure is. And the, uh, the formula for percent yield is the actual yield, which is again obtained from an experiment in a lab, divided by your theoretical yield and then multiplied by 100%. So to, uh, let's go ahead and look at a problem that deals with percent yield. So it says that the theoretical yield of calcium oxide in the previous problem is 12 grams. And it says that a chemist carried out the reaction and isolated 9.5 grams of calcium oxide. And it asks, what is the percent yield of calcium oxide? So again, to get our percent yield, all we're going to have to do is we're going to take our actual yield, that's 9.5 grams of calcium oxide, 
We're going to divide that by our theoretical yield, which is 12 grams of calcium oxide, and we're going to tack on our 100%. And of course, grams of calcium oxide is going to cancel with grams of calcium oxide, and that is going to give us a percent yield of 79%. So that is how to calculate percent yield. All right, so I hope this video was helpful for you guys, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to comment. And uh, all right, you guys uh, have a good one.